Hey everyone, it's Taylorverse. It's been a while. I, uh... Well... I'm not gonna get into details, but... I was having some... Uh -oh. <laughs> problems and... Decided to take a little break. But... Now I'm back, and I have the Hogwarts Library Collection. Let me uh, go to it now. It's got, like, different books in it. So we have A Brief History of Muggle Awareness of Fantastic Beasts. Quidditch to the Ages, which we've read. Uh, the Tales of Beetle the Bard. Albus Dumbledore. Um, a bunch of... There's just a bunch of little stories. So I figured we'd have some fun with this one. So we're going to start with the brief history of Muggle awareness of fantastic beasts. Astonishing though it may seem to many wizards, Muggles have not always been ignorant of the magical and monstrous creatures that we have worked so long and hard to hide. A glance through Muggle art and literature of the Middle Ages reveals that many of the creatures they now believe to be imaginary were known then to be real. The dragon, the griffin, the unicorn, the phoenix, the centaur. These and more are represented in Muggle works of that period, though usually with almost comical inexactitude. However, a closer examination of muggle bestiaries of that period demonstrates that most magical beasts either escape muggle notice completely or are mistaken for something else. Imagine this surviving fragment of manuscript written by one Brother Benedict, a Franciscan monk from Worcestershire. Today, while traveling in the herb garden, I did push aside the basil to discover a ferret of monstrous size. It did not run nor hide as ferrets are wont to do, but leapt upon me, throwing me backwards upon the ground and crying with most unnatural fury, Get out of it, Baldy. It did then bite my nose so viciously that I did bleed for several hours. The friar was unwilling to believe that I had met a talking ferret, and did ask me whether I had been supping of Brother Boniface's turnip wine. As my nose was still swollen and bloody, I was excused vespers. Evidently, our muggle friend had unearthed not a ferret as he supposed, but a jarvey, most likely in pursuit of its favorite prey, gnomes. Imperfect understanding is often more dangerous than ignorance, and the muggles' fear of magic is undoubtedly increased by their dread of what might be lurking in their herb gardens. Muggle persecution of wizards at this time was reaching a pitch hitherto unknown, and sightings of such beasts as dragons and hippogriffs were contributing to muggle hysteria. It is not the aim of this work to discuss the dark days that preceded the wizard's retreat into hiding. All that concerns us here is the fate of those fabulous beasts that, like ourselves, would have to be concealed if muggles were ever to be convinced that there was no such thing as magic. The International Confederation of Wizards argued the matter out at their famous summit meeting in 1692. No fewer than seven weeks of sometimes acrimonious discussion between wizards of all nationalities were devoted to the troublesome question of magical creatures. How many species would we be able to conceal from muggle notice, and which should they be? Where and how should we hide them? 
The debate raged on, some creatures oblivious to the fact that their destiny was being decided. Mm. Fuck off. Others contributing to the debate. At last, agreement was reached. Twenty-seven species, ranging in size from dragons to bundamons, were to be hidden from muggles so as to create the illusion that they had never existed outside the imagination. This number was increased over the following century as wizards became more confident in their methods of concealment. In 1750, Clause 73 was inserted in the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy, to which wizard ministries worldwide confirm, conform today. Each wizarding governing body will be responsible for the concealment care and control of all magical beast beings and spirits dwelling within its territory's borders. Should any such creature cause harm to or draw the notice of the muggle community, that nation's wizarding governing body will be subject to discipline by the International Confederation of Wizards. Magical beasts in hiding. It would be idle to deny that there have been occasional breaches of Clause 73 since it was first put in place. Older British readers will remember the Ufracombe incident of 1932, when a rogue Welsh green dragon swooped down upon a crowded beach full of sunbathing muggles. Fatalities were mercifully prevented by the brave actions of a holidaying wizarding family, subsequently awarded Orders of Merlin first class, when they immediately performed the largest batch of memory charms this century on the inhabitants of Ilfracombe, thus narrowly averting catastrophe. The International Confederation of Wizards has had to fine certain nations repeatedly for contravening Clause 73. Just a hair in my mouth. Palak. Tibet and Scotland are two of the most persistent offenders. Muggle sightings of the Yeti have been so numerous that the International Confederation of Wizards felt it necessary to station an international task force in mountains on a permanent basis. Meanwhile, the world's largest Kelpie continues to evade capture in Loch Ness and appears to have developed a positive thirst for publicity. These unfortunate mishaps, notwithstanding, we wizards may congratulate ourselves on a job well done. There can be no doubt that the overwhelming majority of present-day muggles refuse to believe in the magical beasts their ancestors so feared. Even those muggles who do notice porlock droppings or strealer trails, it would be foolish to suppose that all traces of these creatures can be hidden appear satisfied with the flimsiest non-magical explanation. If any muggle is unwise enough to confide in another that he has spotted a hippogriff winging its way north, he is generally believed to be drunk or a loony. Unfair though this may seem on the muggle in question, it is nevertheless preferable to being burned at the stake or drowned in the village duck pond. So, how does the wizarding community hide fantastic beasts? Luckily, some species do not require much wizarding assistance in avoiding the notice of muggles. Creatures such as the Tebow, the Demiguise, and the Bowtruckle have their own highly effective means of camouflage, and no intervention by the Ministry of Magic has ever been necessary on their behalf. Then there are those beasts that, due to cleverness, or innate shyness, avoid contact with muggles at all costs. For instance, the unicorn, the mooncalf, and the centaur. Other magical creatures inhabit places inaccessible to muggles. One thinks of the acromantula, deep in the uncharted jungle of Borneo, and the phoenix, nesting high on mountain peaks, unreachable without the use of magic. Finally, and most commonly, we have beasts that are too small, too speedy, or too adept at passing for mundane animals to attract a muggle's attention. Chisperfuls, billywigs, and chirps fall into this category. 
Nevertheless, there are still plenty of beasts that, whether willfully or inadvertently, remain conspicuous even to the muggle eye. And it is these that create a significant amount of work for the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. This department, the second largest at the Ministry of Magic, deals with the... Ah, oh, fuck. Deals with the varying needs of the many species under its care in a variety of different ways. Safe habitats. Perhaps the most important step in the concealment of magical creatures is the creation of safe habitats. Muggle repelling charms prevent trespassers into the forest where centaurs and unicorns live, and on the lakes and rivers set aside for the use of mer people. In extreme cases, such as that of the Quintiped, whole areas have been made unplottable. Some of these safe areas must be kept under constant wizarding supervision, for example, dragon reservations. While unicorns and mer people are only too happy to stay within the territories designated for their use, dragons will seek any opportunity to set forth in search of prey beyond the reservation borders. In some cases, muggle-repelling charms will not work, as the beast's own powers will cancel them. Cases in point are the Kelpie, whose sole aim in life is to attract humans towards it, and the Pogrebin. I don't know that one. I can't picture that one. Which seeks out humans for itself. Controls on selling and breeding. The possibility of a muggle being alarmed by any of the larger or more dangerous magical beasts has been greatly reduced by the severe penalties now attached to their breeding and the sale of their young and eggs. The Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures keeps a strict watch on the trade in fantastic beasts. In 1965, ban on experimental breeding has made the creation of new species illegal. Disillusionment charms. The wizard on the street also plays a part in the concealment of magical beasts. Those who own a hippogriff, for example, are bound by law to enchant the beast with a disillusionment charm to distort the vision of any muggle who may see it. Disillusionment charms should be performed daily as their effects are apt to wear off. Memory charms. When the worst happens and a muggle sees what he or she is not supposed to see, the memory charm is perhaps the most useful repair tool. The memory charm may be performed by the owner of the beast in question, but in severe cases of muggle notice, a team of trained obliviators may be sent in by the Ministry of Magic. The Office of Misinformation The Office of Misinformation will become involved in only the very worst magical muggle collisions. Some magical catastrophes or accidents are simply too glaringly obvious to be explained away by muggles without the help of an outside authority. The Office of Misinformation will, in such a case, lays directly with the muggle prime minister to seek a plausible, non-magical explanation for the event. The unstinting efforts of this office in persuading muggles that all photographic evidence of the Loch Ness Kelpie is fake have gone some way to salvaging a situation that at one time looked exceedingly dangerous. Why Magizoology Matters The measures described above merely hint at the full scope and extent of the work done by the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. It remains only to answer that question to which we all in our hearts know the answer. Why do we continue, as a community and as individuals, to attempt to protect and conceal magical beasts, even those that are savage and untamable? The answer is, of course, to ensure that future generations of witches and wizards enjoy their strange beauty and powers as we have been privileged to do. I offer this work as a mere introduction to the wealth of fantastic beasts that inhabit our world. Eighty-one species are described in the following pages, but I do not doubt that more will be discovered, necessitating another revised edition of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. In the meantime, I will merely add that it affords me great pleasure 
to think that generations of young witches and wizards have grown to a fuller knowledge and understanding of fantastic beasts I love through the pages of this book. Ministry of Magic Classifications The Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures gives classifications to all known beasts, beings, and spirits. These offer an at-a-glance guide to the perceived dangerousness of a creature. Five categories are as follows. Five, known wizard killer slash impossible to train or domesticate. Four, dangerous, requires specialist knowledge, skilled wizard may handle. Three, competent wizard should cope. Two, harmless, may be domesticated. One, boring. In some cases, I have felt an explanation for the classification of a particular beast is necessary, and have added footnotes accordingly. An A to Z of Fantastic Beasts Acromantula, Classification 5 The Acromantula is a monstrous eight-eyed spider capable of human speech. It originated in Borneo, where it inhabits... <laughs> inhabits dense jungle making up new fucking words here its distinctive features include the thick black hair that covers its body its leg span which may reach up to 15 feet its pincers which produce a distinctive clicking sound when the acromantula is excited or angry and a poisonous secretion the acromantula is carnivorous and prefers large prey. It spins dome-shaped webs upon the ground. The female is bigger than the male and may lay up to 100 eggs at a time. Soft and white, these are as large as beach balls. The young hatch in six to eight weeks. Acromantula eggs are defined as Class A non-tradable goods by the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, meaning that severe penalties are attached to their importation or sale. This beast is believed to be wizard bred, possibly intended to guard wizard dwellings or treasure, as it is often the case with magically created monsters. Despite its near human intelligence, the Acromantula is untrainable and highly dangerous to wizard and muggles alike. Rumors that a colony of Acromantula has been established in Scotland are unconfirmed. That's a good picture of an acromantula. What the fuck just... How'd that happen? Ashwinder. The Ashwinder is created when a magical fire is allowed to burn unchecked for too long. A thin, pale gray serpent with glowing red eyes. It'll rise from the embers of an unsupervised fire and slither away into the shadows of the dwelling in which it finds itself, leaving an ashy trail behind. The Ashwinder lives for only an hour, and during that time sees a dark, secluded spot in which to lay its eggs, after which it will collapse into dust. Ashwinder eggs are brilliant red and give off intense heat. They will ignite the dwelling within minutes if not found and frozen with a suitable charm. Any wizard realizing that one or oops or more Ashwinders are loose in the house must chase them immediately and locate the nest of eggs. Once frozen, these eggs are great of are of great value for use in love potions and may be eaten whole as a cure for I, um, no, stop it. Ashwinders are found worldwide. Oh, I didn't say the classification for this one. It's a three. Augury. Classification two. The augury is a native of Britain and Ireland. Though sometimes found elsewhere in Northern Europe. A thin and mournful-looking bird, somewhat like a small and underfed vulture in appearance. The augury is greenish-black. It is intensely shy, nests in bramble and thorn, eats large insects and fairies, flies only in heavy rain, and otherwise remains hidden in its tear-shaped nest. 
The augury has a distinctive low and throbbing cry, which was once believed to foretell death. Wizards avoided augury nests for fear of hearing that heart-rending sound, and more than one wizard is believed to have suffered a heart attack on passing a thicket and hearing an unseen augury wail. Patient research eventually revealed, however, that the augury merely sings at the approach of rain. The augury has since enjoyed a vogue as a home weather forecaster, though many find its almost continual moaning during the winter months difficult to bear. Augury feathers are useless as quills because they repel ink. Basilisk Classification 5 the first recorded basilisk was bred by Herpo the Fowl, a Greek dark wizard and parcel mouth, who discovered after much experimentation that a chicken egg hatched beneath the toad would produce a gigantic serpent possessed of extraordinarily dangerous powers. What the fuck? <laughs> Do you take a chicken and just get a snake from a toad? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? Oh, how how do people come up with this shit? It's the best shit ever. Oh, God. Oh. Okay. The basilisk is a brilliant green serpent that may reach up to 50 feet in length. The male has scarlet plume upon its head and has exceptionally venomous fangs, but its most dangerous mean of attacks, attack is its gaze of the large yellow eyes. Anyone looking directly into the eyes will suffer instant death. If the food source is sufficient, the basilisk will eat all mammals and birds and most reptiles. The serpent may attain a very great age. Herbal the Fowl's basilisk is believed to have lived for close on 900 years. The creation of basilisks has been illegal since medieval times, although the practice is easily concealed by simply removing the chicken eggs from beneath the toad when the Department for the Magic for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures comes to call. However, since basilisks are uncontrollable except by parcel mouths, they are as dangerous to most dark wizards as to anybody else. And there have been no recorded sightings of basilisks in Britain for at least 400 years. Billywig, classification three. The billywig is an insect native to Australia. Oh God, anything in Australia is horrible. Fucking gigantic spiders and snakes and fucking, nope. Well, I can live with the snakes. I like snakes, but I don't like aggressive snakes. You know what I mean. It is around half an inch long and a vivid sapphire blue, although its speed is such that it is rarely noticed by muggles and often not by wizards until they have been stung. The billywig's wings are attached to the top of its head and are rotated very fast so that it's... <laughs> A hiccup. <laughs> that was a hiccup. <laughs> I have weird hiccups. <laughs> um, so that it spins as it flies. At the bottom of the body is a long, thin sting. Those who have been stung by a billywig suffer giddiness followed by levitation. 
Generations of young Australian witches and wizards have attempted to catch bullywigs and provoke them into stinging in order to enjoy these side effects. Though too many stings may cause the victim to hover uncontrollably for days on end, and where there is a severe a severe allergic reaction, permanent floating may ensue. Dried bilug stings are used in several potions and are believed to be a component in the popular sweet fizzing whizbies. Bowtruckle Classification 2 The bowtruckle is a tree guardian creature found mainly in the west of England, southern Germany, and certain Scandinavian forests. It is immensely difficult to spot, being small, maximum 8 inches in height, and apparently made of bark and twigs with two small brown eyes. The bowtruckle, which eats insects, is a peaceable and intensely shy creature, but if the tree in which it lives is threatened, it is known to leap down upon the woodcutter or tree surgeon attempting to harm its home and gouge at their eyes with its long, sharp fingers. An offering of wood lice will placate the bow truckle long enough to let a witcher wizard remove wand wood from its tree. Bundamum Classification 3 Bundamuns are found worldwide, skilled at creeping under floorboards and behind skirting boards. They infest houses. The presence of a Bundamun is usually announced by a foul stench of decay. The Bundamun oozes a secretion which rots away the very foundations of the dwelling in which it is found. The Bundamun at rest resembles a patch of greenish fungus with eyes. Though when alarmed, it will scuttle away on a numer on its numerous spindly legs. It feeds on dirt. Scoring chimes will rid a house of an infestation of bundamuns. Though if they have been allowed to grow too large, the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures (Pest Subdivision) should be contacted before the house collapses. Diluted bundamun secretion is used in certain magical cleaning fluids. Centaur Classification 4 The centaur has a human head, torso, and arms joined to a horse's body, which may be any of several colors. Being intelligent and capable of speech, it should not strictly speak... <laughs> it should not, strictly speaking, be termed a beast... But, by its own request, it has been classified as such by the Ministry of Magic. See the introduction of this book? I didn't read the fucking introduction to the book. I never read introductions. The centaur is forest dwelling. Centaurs are believed to have originated in Greece, though there are now centaur communities in many parts of Europe. Wizarding authorities in each of the countries where centaurs are found have uh, allocated areas where centaurs will not be troubled by muggles. However, centaurs stand in little need of wizard protection, having their own means of hiding from humans. The ways of the centaur are shrouded in mystery. They are, generally speaking, as mistrustful of wizards as they are of muggles, and indeed seem to make little differentiation between us. They live in herds ranging in size from 10 to 50 members. That's a big gap. They are reputed to be well versed in magical healing, divination, archery, and astronomy. Chimera, classification 5. The Chimera is a rare Greek monster with a lion's head, goat's body, and a dragon's tail. Vicious and bloodthirsty, the Chimera is extremely dangerous. There is only one known instance of the successful slaying of a Chimera, and the unlucky wizard concerned fell to his own death from his winged horse shortly afterwards. Exhausted by his efforts, Chimera eggs are classified as grade 8 non-tradable goods. Oh, that's a good one. That's badass. Fuckers in action. 
Chisperful. Classification 2. Chisperfuls are small parasites up to a twentieth of an inch high, crab-like in appearance with large fangs. They are attracted by magic and may infest the fur and feathers of such creatures as crepes and auguries. They will also enter wizard dwellings and attack magical objects such as wands, gradually gnawing their way through the magical core. Or else settle in a in dirty cauldrons, where they will gorge upon any lingering drops of potion. Though just purples are easy enough to destroy with any number of patented potions on the market, severe infestations may require a visit from the pest subdivision of the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, as just purples swollen with magical substances will prove very hard to fight. Clabbert, Classification 2. The Clabbert is a tree-dwelling creature, in appearance something like a cross between a monkey and a frog. <laughs> it originated in the southern states of America. That explains a lot. Though it has been seen since... What? Though it has since been exported worldwide. The smooth and hairless skin is a mottled green. The hands and feet are webbed. And the arms and legs are long and supple, enabling the clabbert to swing between branches with the agility of an orangutan. Huh. The head has short horns, and the wide mouth, which appears to be grinning, is full of razor-sharp teeth. I really hope this one has a picture. The clabbert, damn feeds mostly on small lizards and birds. The clabber's most distinctive feature is the large pustule in the middle of its forehead, which turns scarlet and flashes when it senses danger. American wizards once kept clabberts in their gardens to give early warning of approaching muggles. Huh. But the International Confederation of Wizards has introduced fines, which have largely ended this practice. The sight of a tree at night, full of glowing clabbered pustules, while decorative, attracted too many muggles wishing to ask why their neighbors had still had their Christmas lights up in June. Yeah, that makes sense. Crop. Classification 3. The crop originated in the southeast of England. It closely resembles a... Oh, fuck. A Jack Russell Terrier, except for the forked tail. The crop is almost certainly a wizard-created dog, as, is, as it is intensely loyal to wizards and ferocious short smuggles. It is a great scavenger, eating anything from gnomes to old tires. Crop licenses may be obtained from the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures on completion of a simple test to prove that the applicant wizard is capable of controlling the crop in muggle-inhabited areas. Crop owners are legally obliged to remove the crop's tail with a painless severing charm while the crop is six to eight weeks old, lest muggles notice it. That's horrible. Like, fuck. Alright, um, we're gonna stop here. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye.